On our way to get a flip. Bucket of shit. Bucket of shit. We're going on a flip trip. That's the sound of a three thousand dollar car. Hi guys, Stephosaurus Rex here, and today is the third episode of our one thousand dollar to fifty thousand dollar challenge. And with me are the other two members of this group, Hayden <laughs> and John. And yeah, so this one is just going to be a, a sit down. We're not quite sure how the format of this is going to be, but we're all just going to sit down and have a chat about the Z uh, highlights, lowlights, things that went wrong, how we found the car, eventually talking about money. Yeah, let's start talking about the Z. Cool. Well, John, can you probably start off because you found the deal, right? You found the car originally. Yeah, so I remember we were, we hadn't even really planned a challenge at this point. We were just kind of just looking around on Facebook, kind of being bored and on Facebook Marketplace saw this Z pop up for four grand, which seemed one of those too good to be true deals. I had a look and wasn't deregistered, wasn't crashed, wasn't damaged, you know, I had a few bumps and scrapes, but it's a car with 230,000 Ks, automatic, runs, drives, small fred. Seemed a little suspect, but almost seemed too good to not go and check out. For context, Zs are usually like, what, six grand plus? Mid up, six cheap. Yeah, for a cheap one. Yeah. Like, like, normally eight-ish is kind of the bottom of the market. Um, and so it seemed a little suspect, but too good not to go check out. So we messaged the guy on Facebook and then went down and had a look and there was a place down in Weary, which seemed to be a kind of somewhat car dealership slash um, workshop. Um, and the guy that was selling it said it was his wife's car. Um, and long and short, had a look, drove around, all things checked out, nothing was bad, nothing went wrong, drove cleanly, no smoke, no issues, no dodgy history, no anything, and so we bought it. Yeah, it seems surprisingly clean when, it, when we turned up to see it. There were a few things that we've mentioned the car needed, so he, he pointed out to us that the valve cover gasket was leaky, one of them was leaky, we'll talk about that later, um, and he also mentioned that the NOx sensor was faulty, so it was throwing check engine lights based on the NOx sensor being faulty, which is a pretty common fault with these cars. Yeah, not a huge um, issue to fix either. And it was mainly just a general untidiness with the car. Um, that was that was pretty much it that was disclosed when we purchased it. So. When it was advertised, it was one rocket cover gasket that, that he claimed was replaced and he gave us the, uh, the box for it and everything, but there was still very clearly a leak. Yeah, <laughs> it does them quite significantly. Yeah. So we ended up pulling it all, all apart, replacing both of them because they were both extremely leaky. Yeah. Mm. Um, the and uh, one. yeah, unfortunately, pinched one. Um, <laughs> not easy to put on, and uh, turns out we didn't get it right the first time. So we pinched the uh, gasket on one of them, um, put it all back together, hell of a mission. Had to pull it all apart again and realized it was still leaking. <laughs> and to rub salt the wound, we had to replace the gasket with paint because we damaged it. Yeah. So I had to buy a new gasket for that. It was quite interesting because around that point, um, obviously we hadn't removed the spark plugs and coil packs or anything at this point because you didn't really need to. But <laughs> one, of, one of them, the coil pack was really lodged in. And I remember I was talking to Hayden, I'm like, dude, this shouldn't be this hard to remove. And he's like, oh, just yank it, just yank it, it'll be fine. Pulled it off and the thing just came in pieces. I <laughs> think the top part of it came off. And so we were like, us, while they were sort of doing the gas, I was sort of, you know, getting the flathead down there, trying to trying to put the rubber aside and see what is keep keep causing it. And you could just see this this line of, of white goop. And I'm just like, oh my god, some idiot. <laughs> Someone's blown it in. Someone's filled it with gasket sealant. <laughs> so at this point, Hayden's like, just ignore it, just ignore it. So we like, it'll be fine, to, it'll be fine. Yeah, we just like tried to force this broken unit back together and plugged it all in. We're like, just. Okay, we even saw that. <laughs> that didn't pan out because it's almost far. No, it didn't, it didn't work so well. That unfortunately, didn't work so no, well. We um, put everything back together, fired up the car, and it misfired so badly. And it, <laughs> on, on the plus side, we'd already pinched a gas to take it apart again. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we've become quite good at pulling the intake off. Yeah, and we, it all we've, apart. Learned, we've learned the VQ very well now. Yeah, <laughs> the, top, the top side of it's a little, the space isn't great, but we know how to take it apart. We, so we, we slowly had this issue where we were basically just constantly battling coil packs because the car obviously started misfiring. We put the scan tool on and it was saying it was a coil pack error. Um, so we bought a replacement coil pack. Like, 
cut out and removed. Oh no, before we, we even no, met, we, we unplugged and... We unplugged each individual yeah. to track down which one was misfiring. And we, we narrowed it down to one. We were sure it was one because yeah. we'd unplugged it. It was a different it, unit. And then yeah. we yeah. resistance worse, tested yeah. it as well and it was showing the resistance wasn't giving feedback. So it, was, it wasn't a circuit in the call pack, so it was definitely dead. And we replaced that and it ran fine for about two minutes and then it decided what to misfire again. Yeah. So then we just sort of it and replaced every coil pack, every spark plug, um, because even the one that was glued back together it was still operational. Was operational, yeah. which made very little sense, but it was working. Um, so we eventually decided to replace all the coils, replace all the plugs, be safe, do it properly, rather than kind of do it on the cheap because it was only going to be chasing issues. And um, definitely by the end of that, that damaged coil pack was very much irreparable. Uh, was it made <laughs> we, had to, we had to cut it out. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was difficult to get out, but we, we managed to get it all out 100% of it yeah. at the end. It was it probably took about an hour and a half of <laughs> scraping with a screwdriver and a little cutty blade just to, uh, just yeah, to get it out. You don't quite realise how small that hole is until you actually have to cut away at it. Yeah. And, and, and especially when it gets closer to the plug, because mm. obviously with the socket set, you can't you can't yeah, fit it through there because there's glue. So and they're glued right <laughs> Right down to the bottom. Yeah, end. yeah, it just yeah. sinked right in. So it took a while, but we eventually got it all out. The plugs were all pretty old and yeah, needed to be done anyway. So. Anyway, so it was worth doing. Yeah, and then got it all back together, fired it up. Finally, not misfiring as you'd expect after doing that. But since then, it has had a persistent uh, check engine light for coil packs and saying it's misfiring. But in fact, it runs perfectly. It's been cleared numerous times, but it's mm. just decided it has that now, mm. um, which seems again a little, little odd, but almost a bit to our basket of. It's yeah. cleared, it's fine, it runs perfectly. <laughs> we had a brand new set of coil packs, brand new set of spark plugs. Um, car runs absolutely flawlessly now, yeah. and you can you clear the code and drive it for a little while and occasionally it will come back, but there is, there's absolutely no misfiring, so I can't get my head around Yeah, what's, I mean, I've been solidly on. driving it for about a week, trying to see if we can try and... Yeah, code code or five minutes. Here or feel something <laughs> fail, but it's, it's been fine. It's yeah. just that code. Yeah. Um, and I suppose the other one to talk about on the engine side is the knock sensor harness, which oh. had so knock sensor harnesses, if you do some Googling on 350Z seem to be quite common, either the harness or the sensor fail. Um, and they throw a check engine light and occasionally put the car into limp mode. So when we did buy this was this closed, it said oh, it's once gone to limp mode and it just won't replicate the two thousand RPM or something to that effect. Um, and we didn't have it on the drive home, we hadn't had it ever impact us, but we said, okay, well, we'll change that, obviously, it's a reasonably easy fix. Um, and it wasn't the end of the world to get to, you had to take the upper and lower intake manifolds and the fuel rail, um, but nothing major. And so we get to it and find the sensor itself looks fine and functional, but we buy a sensor anyway, and we buy a harness, and eventually what we find out is somebody's attempted to repair the harness, and Hayden, Hayden took it apart so he could tell you. <laughs> We realized probably before we uh, before we bought the new one, we were planning on just buying the knock sensor sensor. Like when you have a knock sensor fail, you just buy the sensor. It's a hundred dollars. You plug it in, you're done. But um, with the V2 series engine, the the sensor, because it's a V engine configuration, is right in the middle of the block, and there's absolutely no ventilation at all. So the engine gets extremely hot, warms up the air in the middle of the engine, or in the middle of the sort of block, this cavity. And uh, the harness runs right through that cavity and it's absolutely brittle. The insulation just flakes off. It's probably like, from a repair and, and from a from a reliability perspective, a, a terrible design. It's one of those, <laughs> we see those memes with mechanics hate engineers. Yeah. <laughs> this is exactly why. I, I took the knock sensor up, picked the cable up and all the insulation <laughs> flaking off as I picked it up. So we absolutely needed a new, um, a new harness. Uh, we thought, hey, we can probably repair it. We'll have a look, and, and but all the insulation was gone, and uh, it was covered by this little corrugated plastic tubing. So we pulled that off to have a look inside, and it looks like someone in the past. It's a two-wire um, knock sensor, and it looks like someone in the past has cut the wires on each side and just run a single wire. But it, <laughs> I mean, whether it worked or not, I don't know. It just was like the worst workmanship I've ever seen. I mean, I, it was I, such a horrible job. Electrical is not my strong suit, but I feel like if it has a two wires for some kind of signal, it's just <laughs> soldering them both together, it's not going to fix it. Yeah. <laughs> it was such, <laughs> such a bad job. I looked at it and I couldn't believe it. I'm like, man, somebody went to the effort to pull this intake off, and they thought instead of replacing the harness, we're going to. It was quite, it was quite hilarious because yeah, we, we, we started to peel it back and, and saw this one end, and we were like, 
oh, surely it's not the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> it was back all over the plastic, and sure enough, from end to end, it was completely done. Yeah, it, was just, it was just these tiny bits at the end where the plug actually you know, clipped in, that it was still two wires. You know, they just... <laughs> it, was, it was about 45 minutes to get to it. wasn't a small job to get to and put back together. You simply go, you, you put the effort into to get there, you think you'd fix it properly. It's like <laughs> taking the gearbox up and finding your clutch is three quarters of water, you'd be like, oh, it's around. all right. <laughs> 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 give, it, give it a bit of spit polish and <laughs> put it back on. <laughs> Watch some sandpaper over it if you're Yeah, <laughs> scuff it up. But no, ended up replacing that along with the knock sensor and turns out these guys in the States do um, a harness that is shielded with uh, some steel, I think it's steel yeah. mesh shielding. It's I designed think, to last. The, yeah. Designed to last and designed to keep rodents out from eating. I, we don't really get that problem in no. New Zealand, but hey, it looks pretty good. It was yeah, reasonably it was priced and eh, did what we needed. So yeah. pick that up and stuck it in. I suppose what else did we fix? Bootstraps, which are bootstraps, they were failed, so we took out a part, but a new part that doesn't fall over anymore. It's just easy just to replace them rather than get them re gassed. I yeah, think they were like $40 a, for a pair or yeah, something. Yeah. Not, not, it'd be more money and more fuss to get them re gassed. Mm -hmm. just get a self trade made, slap them in, job's done. Ooh, what else did we fix? Is there much else that we've done to this car? Not really, that's speed over, but that's now. Included in the car if somebody we, wants yeah. to have a go at it provide, themselves. Provide the new buy the speedo. The, yeah. the, 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 probably the best way to do it is to install the new speedometer and take it to one of those places that reset the odometer. Yeah. So you can go in and they'll reset, you know, whatever the odometer yeah. is, Although, whatever the car fair, should be. A lot of um, cheap Z buyers may be more keen to have a suddenly much lower KZ than yeah. <laughs> but Up to the new owner. Yeah. Not, not a position I think we would put ourselves in. But I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Um, then I suppose other than that, we just gave it a whole kind of spin polish, so we spent, you know, a fair few hours going over it, polishing the whole car. Yeah, John um, learned how to, how to use a polishing tool and yeah. spent um, about half a day with one of our friends as a detailer on the other side, just showing them the ropes and yeah. teaching them how to make a car, not, you know, how to polish a tin, essentially. Yeah, because I mean, it was, for, to be fair, for its age, it's pretty good, yeah. but it had, it's a car that someone has used for 230,000 Ks, they've left outside for most of its life, so it was very oxidised. No, no significant fading, so their paint has actually seems to be in reasonably good condition. I wouldn't be surprised at the fact when it left outside and not washed greatly, meaning it had a kind of protective layer of dirt. It was kind of interesting <laughs> actually because um, obviously the guy that we bought it off at Frank Hills for his wife, but he only had it for about three weeks. Yeah, according to Car Jam, yeah. in fact. So but the previous, the previous owner before him had it nine years, so you know that, that says a lot about the car to have it for such a long time. Yeah, someone care. Keep it in good nick. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, it's had. A fair, it looks an awful lot better than we got it, and to be fair, for the car and for the age, it's got one reasonable scuff on the front bumper, and that's really it. Yeah. Like, other than that, it's polished up really well, painted it actually looks in pretty good nick, and if you just keep some due attention on it, it'll be a good looking car for years to come. So this brings us to our final clip, all about the money. We purchased the car for $3,500, which between the three of us meant an initial payment of $1,200. From there, we purchased the following components. Bootstraps, $50. Key fob, $50. Rocker cover gaskets, $99. Knock sensor harness, $160. Dash cluster, $84. Spark plugs, $56. And lastly, coil packs for $235. This means that the car owes us $734 in parts, plus the purchase price of three and a half grand for a total of $4,234. That was the baseline for this car. We ended up selling the car for $5,500, which netted $1,833.33 between the three of us. However, with all the expenses reimbursed, we were left with a net profit of $1,216, which means that each of us walked away with $405.33 profit, which is pretty good for a first split. And with that concludes our 350Z series. I know it was brief, but thank you guys so much for sticking with us, and we really look forward to releasing our next video, which will also be very brief. <laughs> we've just finished uh, building and we've actually sold our second car so that'll be released in the next week or so and that will only be one episode so now we're just currently on the market looking for the next project but yeah again thank you guys so much for staying in touch and yeah I hope you guys enjoy what you've watched so far and looking forward to what's next for us.